Thanks. Hi everyone. Uh, like Dan said, I'm JP. I work at Trail of Bits. And uh, I'm giving a talk about some new ways to think about testing. So let's talk about how we usually test smart contracts. Um, usually, when we want to know if our code's correct, we figure out some things that our code can do. And then we do them. And then if it does the right thing, we show a green check mark. And if not, we show a red X. And this is a really good idea, and everyone should be doing it. And you probably don't have enough tests. But this is a really simple way to think about code correctness compared to how complicated code correctness is as an issue. Um, and that's uh, the problem that I'm addressing in this talk. Because when we do something like on this first slide, where we specify a single sequence of transactions, or a single input, or some single argument to our function, then that is one very, very small part of the total space of transaction sequences, or inputs, or arguments, or whatever. So if we have the call sequence that we just looked at, we can ask, what if that was in a different order? What if we did part of it twice? Or what if we swapped out one thing for another? Or what if right before that happened, someone else called approve? And we try to fix this by writing more tests and writing more comprehensive tests. And we find a bug. We add some regression tests. But like I said, really, really big space. Very, very hard to cover it by picking single points. Still a good idea. Still totally a thing you need to do. But not that comprehensive. So let's ask, how could we be better? And the answer is, we can generalize on the input. Normally when I test, I, I put some functions up here from kind of regular code. We pick one input to these functions, and that's the thing we test. So I'm testing my function f, and I test it with the input 3, and I say that when the input is 3, my output is 1,337. Or I'm testing my sort function. And when it says 1, 4, 2, 13, uh, and I sort that, I get out 1, 13, 2, 4. Bonus points if you recognize what sort function that is. Great language. So I can generalize those tests. and instead of capturing the behavior on one point, capture the behavior on the whole space. So I could say that no matter what the input is, my function f should make it more leet. Or I say that no matter what my list is, after I sort it, it should be in alphabetical order. That's what sorting means. When we talk about this specifically on solidity, what we say, is that um, instead of unit tests, which specify one sequence of transactions and interactions with a contract, we say that for, or sorry, I got a slide ahead of myself. Um, that's the slide I wanted to look at. So when we do this on Solidity, instead of running a test for one sequence of transactions, we instead talk about any possible sequence of transactions. Instead of that approve, then transfer from, then whatever, we say that no matter what transactions you call in what order, you should never lose money from your contract, or you should never have the contract self-destruct, or this is protected, so you should never be able to change the owner unless whatever. And the problem is, writing these tests Still pretty easy, right? Um, maybe even easier than writing unit tests. We don't have to pick a single input. We don't need to pick a single transaction sequence. We can just describe these global behaviors of the contract that we're testing. So this is, this is really nice from the perspective of creating the test itself, but much harder from the perspective of evaluating it. 
when I ask Geth to run a particular transaction sequence, it does so with no complaints. When I ask Geth to run all possible transaction sequences, that takes a very long time. Uh, it's, it's not immediately tractable. So to test all possible transaction sequences, I have two options. Either I pick some transaction sequences to test, or I think about it harder and I actually do test all of them. And I'm going to talk about both approaches. The first approach, I wrote a tool called Echidna to do. What Echidna does is it takes a contract, and from that contract's ABI, it generates a ton of random transaction sequences and then evaluates all of them. And then every time it does this evaluation, it checks if some property holds. So this, this doesn't mean that you've gone over every possible transaction sequence, but where your old unit test covered one input, this might cover 10,000. Um, you should still have unit tests, you should still write unit tests, but frequently you will have a better time checking for bugs with 10,000 inputs than one input, especially because devs know test inputs. Um, I don't know if anyone went to school for CS and did those dumb auto-graded assignments where they have a bunch of tests and you just need to pass those tests and you get the points and you can like go on with your life. That is not just a skill you use in college. Devs love to just get tests green and keep going. But when you don't know the tests, there are 10,000 of them, that's much harder. And sometimes it's easier to just write correct code than to go and make your incorrect code pass all the tests. That's a kind of cynical view on a fuzzing, but it's the accurate one. But let's talk about when you really want that guarantee. Remember, we're talking about all possible transaction sequences. 10,000 is a pretty small number. So to test all possible inputs, we have to get fancier than just picking random inputs and evaluating them on our regular VM. So what we do for that is we write a whole new EVM. On the regular EVM, when we have a value to something in the stack or the value of a state variable, or a field in a transaction like call data, that value has to be a number that we know. It has to be a concrete single value that um, is set to some particular thing. So Trail of Bits wrote Manticore, which lets values not just be one particular thing, but instead all possible things that match some condition. Instead of just saying that my first argument to f is one number, I can say that my first argument to f is any even number. And this means that the relationship between Manticore and a traditional EVM, like Geth or Parity, is similar to the relationship between property testing and unit testing. I can express this notion of for all with constraints, and Manticore doesn't need me to pick random things or translate that down. That's just how it executes. The, the reasons it can do that are kind of complicated, and I'm not going to talk about them at all, but you can go on GitHub and figure it out. Good luck. Um, once we have this machine, though, it's really easy to do property testing on it. You just execute with any possible initial transaction or any sequence of two transactions. And Manticore executes that just like Geth would execute with this particular initial transaction or with these particular two transactions. So then if, when it executes, it finds that it sometimes can possibly fail, then we use a constraint solver to work out exactly why and how it fails. And if we find that it never possibly fails, then uh, that's pretty good. We can print a little green check mark and you can go release that code unto the world. Again, 
like Echidna gave us some advantages over conventional unit tests because it is much easier to get one test to pass than 10,000 random tests to pass. This gives us some advantages over Echidna because it is all possible tests. Um, as a side effect of doing property testing thoroughly, we have reinvented formal verification and started doing it to our code. One of the nice things about property testing is that when you do it well, you get formal verification by accident. Um, and that dichotomy is explained a little bit more explicitly here. Manticore is maybe harder to start using with your code because what you get out of it is a proof and it works on the total set of transaction sequences. It'll take a long time to run because it's doing a lot of math and you might have some weird error messages. Echidna is pretty easy to use. You only need to write Solidity. You never need to worry about a second programming language, but it's random and there's a chance that you miss stuff. Again, 10,000 is a pretty small number compared to the number of possible transaction sequences. If the failure modes are relatively likely, then you'll totally hit them. But if there's one weird edge case, there's no guarantees. Um, if you want some concrete recommendations, because this talk was fun and all, but you gotta go home and write code tomorrow, if you're just doing a fun project, then you don't need to worry about property testing that much. Property testing is an investment that you do when you need your code to work correctly. If you just wanna have like pictures of cats, but on Ethereum, then you do you, man, congrats. Um, but if that's not what you're doing, if you don't have unit tests, the first thing you should do is write some unit tests. Hopefully I'm not the first person to tell you this, but having some unit tests is really important. You should go home and you should do that as soon as possible. You will be really glad that that's what you did. If you have some existing unit tests, then you can maybe do better than your existing unit tests by using Echidna, generate a ton of new random tests. Uh, we already talked about why this is a good idea, but it's a pretty easy incremental improvement. You can still just write Solidity. You can download one new program, which I already have put in a Docker container. If you have Docker installed, you can Docker pull trail of bits slash Echidna, and then you have Echidna and can use it. And it's an incremental improvement. If you already have Echidna, or if there's some stuff that you really need to be right, because you have a ton of money going through your contract, then A, maybe give trail of bits a call, B, you can use Manticore to make sure that the thing you really need to be right is actually right. That is the thing that it's really good at. Um, there are different levels of testing you can do based on your willingness to invest in the thoroughness you need. There's no one size fits all solution. And while this is a really cool technique, it doesn't work the same way for everyone because software projects are pretty different from one another. Um, anyway, that's my talk. I'm JP. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or GitHub or wherever, and I have an email address. Any questions?